All right, folks, this is Harris Sultan. And as you guys know, I've been talking to some pro-Israeli voices, or some people call them Zionists, while they are Zionists. I sometimes have referred to myself as a Zionist because I do believe that the Jewish people deserve a homeland. But I've also been meaning to get some pro-Palestinian voices. But it's very difficult to get a pro-Palestinian voice that can sit with someone like me. So I ran into this gentleman about three months ago, and I've been meaning to talk to him ever since, but I've just been busy with other stuff. I've been following him on Twitter, and a lot of people follow him. People like Simon Seabag Montefiore follows him, Maddy Hassan follows him, and so many other people follow him. Because what he says makes sense. And there's a lot of stuff that I have seen from his Twitter, which I wasn't aware of, or I hadn't thought about it from that angle. So I asked him if he would like to chat with me, because in my opinion, Palestinian voices are not being fairly represented, especially in the West. We see these so-called pro-Palestine voices, when in reality, in my opinion, they are pro-Hamas, and I think they're not interested in preserving Palestinian lives. In my opinion, it seems that they have this Islamic fetish of conquering Jerusalem and in the process, sacrifice Palestinian people. And my point is, should they really be dying so you can fulfill your whatever fetish that you have? So that's why I think instead of listening to Pakistanis or Bangladeshis or some other Middle Eastern people on what should happen with Palestine and Israel, I think we should speak with Palestinian people. So Ahmed al Khatib is a Palestinian based in America from Gaza, has family in Gaza, regularly posts about his family members who are stuck in Gaza, who are going through this terrible ordeal. So without further ado, let's just talk to Ahmed. Ahmed, thank you very much for doing this. Let me get some questions out of the way. So people who listen to me, people who are, let's just say, pro-Israel, I've been trying to tell them that there are so many Palestinian people who don't like Hamas, who don't want this conflict to keep on going, who don't want to die, who don't have this martyr fetish. There are so many other Palestinians who just want to live we just want to move on with their lives. But they are also being held hostage, not only just by Hamas, but also this Muslim diaspora that is living all around the world. So I'm going to ask you some blunt questions. So just get it out of the way so people on the pro-Israel side can actually see what side of Palestine you represent. Do you condemn Hamas? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my whole lived experience has been impacted negatively by Hamas and by their terror, by their actions, by their choices and decisions. And for me, I think people shouldn't wait to be asked whether or not you condemn Hamas. Um, people should organically and naturally on their own without any prerequisites be able to clearly and explicitly state their opposition to Hamas. We shouldn't wait to be asked whether or not we condemn Hamas. I think it's so clear that Hamas has been incredibly damaging and detrimental to the Palestine national movement to Palestinians just an urgent cause and, and aspirations for statehood and self-determination. I also would say that, you know, I mean, yeah, not all Palestinians are Hamas. Not all Gazans love Hamas and support Hamas. This idea that Gazans voted for Hamas, so therefore they deserve what's happened to them is absolutely inaccurate. These elections happened in 2006, almost 18 years ago. Half of Gaza wasn't even born back then. The population was 1.4, now it's 2.3. And I also will actually go a step further and say, yes, I've been alarmed by what I believe as the normalization of Hamas and the mainstreaming of pro-Hamas sentiments. However, I strongly believe, and I'm not, even though they, a lot of them do attack me regularly, a lot of pro-Palestine activists, including the unskillful ones, the ones that I vehemently disagree with, are not actually pro-Hamas. They just I would say misinformed. And I would say some of them are just like, call it ignorance, call it blind rage, call it, you know, their heart often can be in the right place, but they are so blind and entrenched in their narrative. And also people think now is not the time to condemn Hamas. Now is the time to solely and exclusively focus on Israel. To me, I see what's happening as inseparable. I see Hamas as being a, a fundamental component of the horrible situation that we're in, even as I have criticized and condemned Israeli actions and I, I including the killing of dozens of my family members. I believe that was a war crime. That said, 
I think we should immediately and easily, it shouldn't be contentious. I see all these characters going on Piers Morgan. And I'm not just talking about Andrew Tate or some of those other, you know, personalities. Do but, you use Hayes like, Muhammad Jobs? You know, yeah, those I have my own challenges with. We'll get to that in a second. And I'm trying to be charitable here and I'm trying to be polite and I'm trying to not, you know, burn bridges, if you will. But I'm talking about the Palestinian ambassador to the UK. The Palestinian Authority was ejected violently by Hamas from Gaza in 2007. And Hamas killed upward of a thousand people mm. in that violent coup and was throwing Fatah members off the rooftops. Mm. So there's just this, unfortunately, Hamas has moved the Overton window, whereby being, you know, part of the pro-Palestine movement and being seen as a loyal Palestinian means it, you know, you should at all costs of pivot away from condemning Hamas. And, and I think actually, no, the pro-Palestine movement is bolstered by criticizing Hamas, understanding them, understanding their history, understanding the, the, the horrors of Islamism and how it has d destroyed different aspects of the Palestinian uh, national project. So absolutely, I am like, I, I have it in my Twitter bio. I want people to be open and clear and unequivocal in their condemnation of Hamas. That is not something, that is almost a badge of honor. That is not something to run away from. Hamas is not an organic expression of resistance. Hamas is a violent organization that has committed horrible atrocities against Israelis and against Palestinians. Hamas destroyed a fragile yet viable peace process. Hamas has absolutely harmed the Palestinian people in Gaza in so many ways that we'll get to. Okay. And it is absolutely worthy of condemnation. Yeah. yeah, but how much support do you think Hamas has in Palestinian territories in general, but in Gaza in particular? Because I have shared this survey quite a few times because I think mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would help a lot of people on the other side to not, not to paint all Palestinians with the same brush. But some people have raised concerns over the capacity of this survey. I think you're probably one of them too, but I'll just share that for the record. So in your view, given what happened after it, was Hamas's decision to launch its offensive against Israel on 7th of October a correct or incorrect one? So the key part is what happened after it, i.e. the wrath of Israel. So people who are going through that, a big percentage of them, 37%, that translates as 800,000 Gazans. They say, nope, now we've seen that what Israel has done to our Gaza, I think that was bad. Now, it still doesn't make up a majority. And this is Palestine's own survey. And then on the other hand, people in the West Bank who are not going, I mean, I get it, there are other issues like settlement issues, and then there's always some scuffles taking place between the IDF and Palestinian people. But by and large, I mean, they're not going through what people of Gaza are going through. So 82% over there are saying, yep, good, well done. So that tells me that people who bear the brunt of it, they might not be happy with that. Whereas Muslims living outside of the immediate disaster zone, they want to keep the fight going. So in your opinion, how much support does Hamas enjoy at the moment in Gaza? Well, let's start just with the latter one. I mean, I will say the piece, and I don't speak often about the West Bank because I've never actually set foot in the West Bank. And I share your assessment that, yes, those who have to experience the consequences of Hamas's armed resistance and these, you know, so this, so these supposed acts of resistance that are going to liberate all of Palestine. And they love to slap anything Aqsa, you know, the Jerusalem. And just if you want to do an operation, like every time they do something horrible, they just slap the name Aqsa or Jerusalem onto it to justify it. But I don't think people in the West Bank are driven by, in my assessment, even though Jerusalem is a very important issue for a lot of people, I do think there's something to be said about a nationalistic drive and the resentment due to their perception that the Palestinian authorities has prevented mass intifadas and is committed to nonviolence and doesn't actively attack Israel. And yet that has failed to achieve a favorable outcome to them, even though I think there are a lot of issues with the Palestinian Authority. I've been a fierce critic. I think Abbas walking away from the Ulmer deal in 2008 was a disaster. And my intention isn't to manufacture dissent where none exists, but I have vehemently challenged those surveys 
from the sample point of view. I mean, look at what happened in the United States in 2016 and how surveys got the whole election in a wrong. free democratic society entirely wrong. You're talking about an undemocratic society in Gaza. If you ask people, what do you think? A lot of people are, are very paranoid about giving you their true opinion. They're either going to think somehow this relates to you being an Israeli informant or somehow you're an informant for Hamas. The samples, the accessibility, and Hamas also has Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups and cyber warriors that it mobilizes whenever it knows there's an online or an in-person survey. They specifically, this is well understood in Gaza, they mobilize these people and push them to participate in a variety of surveys to inflate the amount of public support. Again, of course, there's ideological support for Hamas, and we're going to get to that. But my intention is to say these surveys, just from a sample point of view, from a cultural context point of view, and from just accessibility and, and reaching people in conflict. And, and for example, the, the, the surveys that they did after the war were in southern Gaza, which at the time had not had the war expand to it. Most of the war was in the north, even though there was bombardment throughout. So think of here's Hamas's opposition and here is Hamas's support. Let's think of support for Hamas. There are tiers of that. And I use this silly onion analogy, you know, with the different layers of it, but the, the core of the onion of Hamas's support are very much so ideological people that are motivated by, call it Islamist and Islamic ideals, but mainly Islamists that combines a political program with the religious component that wants to see all of Palestine liberated, even though Hamas says, well, we'll accept the 67 border. Yes, we will. No, we won't. Yes, we will. That is motivated by religion, is motivated by what they believe as Quranic instructions to carry on a holy jihad, to liberate the third, third holiest site in Islam. And then you start building up a little bit from that core ideological support to a series of membership affiliates and supporters who are motivated by the perception that Hamas was successful in ejecting Israel in 2005. This is what they believe. They believe that armed resistance against the settlement in Gaza in the Second Intifada is why Israel actually pulled out of Gaza in 2005, which I think that is subject to debate. There were a lot of costly attacks against Israelis, but I don't for a second believe that Israel pulled out of the settlements because of Hamas. Then you have people where, because Hamas is a militant out? group. Why did they pull out? I think they pulled out because Gaza was a headache historically. I mean, Yitzhak Rabin in the 70s. Gaza is a very difficult place to rule because there's it's generally closed off. You have the Mediterranean, which they haven't really had access to the world through the Mediterranean since 67. You have the Sinai Peninsula or desert really to the west. And then you have them squeezed into Israel, unlike the West Bank, which is much bigger geographically and population size. There are also a lot more Christians. Also, West Bank is largely open to the outside world through Jordan. Gaza is largely isolated. I mean, right now, the majority of Gazans, something like close to two thirds of Gazans have never left the coastal enclave. And a huge number of that are children. Israel, for example, wanted to give Egypt the Gaza Strip during the 1977 Camp David peace accords. But Anwar Sadat of Egypt refused because he actually told Arafat, come on, let's use this as an opportunity and actually get the West Bank and Gaza, the 67 borders that the Palestinians right now want. We could have had that many times over. That famous saying, unfortunately, and sadly, the Palestinian leadership doesn't miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. But so Hamas, unfortunately, has t convinced a lot of people that its resistance was able to push Israel out when, in fact, Ariel Sharon, and I was in Gaza at the time. I'm 33. I was 15 when I left Gaza in 2005, one month before the withdrawal of Israeli settlements. I mean, there were pressures on Israel, like from a security point of view, like what are we going to do? Should we do a massive crackdown against Gazans? Or should we potentially leave Gaza and potentially try to use it as an opportunity as a test case, if you will, for peace, even though there were others in Israel who actually wanted to restrict Gaza. Basically, there was a nefarious project, and this is well documented in Israeli press, to basically expand settlements in the West Bank, but get rid of them in Gaza. And they call it the Gaza first, Gaza last model. 
they wanted the Palestinian state to take place only in Gaza and basically eat away at the, at the West Bank. But that's a whole other thing for why Israel pulled out. But it is not true. Hamas thinks that it pushed Israel out of Gaza. That is not true. Unfortunately, that delusion and that lie penetrated so many Palestinian minds, particularly in parallel with the incompetence and corruption of the secular Palestinian Authority. So, so going back to the original question, so you're doubting these surveys for various reasons. Are you telling me that the number of people who are against Hamas is higher than 37% or could be higher than that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you simply why. Aside from the fact that I talk to people, aside from the fact that I give messages, aside from the fact that I follow a bajillion accounts, if you're standing in line to use a dirty bathroom with 200 other people or a dirty toilet at a UN school, you're not standing there thinking, gee, wow, October 7th was such a success, man. Like our mm. Palestine is liberated. Jerusalem is, is here. If you're yeah. trying to fetch the slightest amount of food, and so like some of it is from a consequence point of view, right? In terms of we weren't consulted. Yes, there were a few thousand that celebrated this, but I remember vividly right when October 7th happened. It was October 6th here and Friday night. And I remember going to social media and I remember seeing hundreds of Palestinian accounts that I have followed for years saying, oh my God, guys, as we know, it is going to cease to exist. You just un opened the gates of hell upon us. Or because there were protests against Hamas in July and August of 2023, two to three months before October 7th, a lot of people were convinced that Hamas is basically running away from its political and governance failures by doing such a massive attack to but then why is it, reinvigorate but then, the spirits of resistance. You're saying that you saw a lot of Palestinian accounts who were condemning that and that they knew what was going to come. But then this Muslim diaspora, they were celebrating it. And I remember quote tweeting a lot of those people, like, you don't know what's going to happen to Palestinian people. They showed videos of some Palestinian people who were celebrating when the body of Shani Locke was paraded and people were spitting on her. So we knew that that's bad news. But why is it that, look, as I said, like, I've never really commented on Palestinian people because I think they're going through this conflict. So I don't know how their mind works. And even if they hate Israel, I think they're well within the rights to do that because when you're locked in a conflict to that extent for such a long period of time, then yeah, hostilities can arise. But my question to you is about the Muslim diaspora that celebrates, Absolutely. That, that eggs people to hate on Israel. It's like they get a kick out of this conflict. They want this conflict to expand. And, and then when it happens, it's the Palestinians who die, and then they start becoming champions for Palestinian lives. What is your opinion on those people who are celebrating it? Well, well, I mean, yes, and like I said, I stand by my belief that the real numbers, I mean, and we see the protests in Gaza. I mean, imagine how much courage you have to be facing Israeli bombardment on one side and being hungry, but at the same time, still coming out and speaking out against Hamas in oh. Gaza. And, and when those protests happen... Not one of the mainstream supposed pro-Palestine people amplify those voices or share them. Yeah. Some even have gone, and I've seen them, they've gone to accuse them as being Israeli agents and spies and, and, and assets, intelligence assets, which I think is shameful. But Harris, that, that's part of why I decided to come forward after October 7th. I mean, you know, right now I have, what, 26,000 whatever followers on Twitter. I had three followers on Twitter on October 7th, okay? I was just using it as a surfing account. I work in international development. I have a job. I've done well for myself. I've worked really hard to be where I'm at. But I decided to come forward and speak out against this because I was horrified by the mainstreaming of pro-Hamas sentiments at a time when so many Gazans were turning against the group. It allowed the dehumanization of Palestinians to become mainstream. It destroyed the pro-Palestine movement. It normalized violence before October 7th, a lot of people would say, oh, well, I'm actually, I don't like Hamas, but the Israeli occupation. Well, I don't agree with Hamas, but the blockade. Then those very people, unfortunately, upgraded to actual like full on Hamas enthusiasts. And again, it is two things are true at once. Not every single person who's protesting for Palestine is pro Hamas. I think that is inaccurate. That is a gross generalization. And there are also many horrendous voices that allege to be pro-Palestine when in fact they refuse to condemn Hamas, they refuse to acknowledge 
the root causes of a lot of where we're at right now. They refuse to acknowledge that Hamas made choices that brought upon the blockade, that brought upon the end of the peace process, that brought upon further conflict and death. So that's why I decided to come forward is to counteract the impact of those diaspora pro-Palestine voices, which I thought were incredibly harmful and incredibly undermined the Palestinian voices and narratives. But how popular is your voice? Because as I said, it seems like that people like this guy, Dili Hussein, Mohammed Hijabs, you know, these people, they, they have huge followings now. Look at him. He just tweeted this. Jerusalem was conquered by the Meccan Arab Caliph Omar. Jerusalem was liberated after 88 years of crus crusader occupation by the Iraqi Kurd Salahuddin, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, ask the main Palestinian resistance groups if their cause is an Islamic one. Ask the Imam of Al-Aqsa if the Palestinian cause is an Islamic one. Ask the people of Gaza. Now, here we go. Janine and Neb Nablus, if their cause is an Islamic one, none of them will mention decolonial theory or so as lecturers. They all say jihad fi sabilillah, and he's making the case here, not to mention the verses of the Quran and statements of the Prophet linking Masjid al-Aqsa and Jerusalem to the entire Muslim ummah. As I said, these people who are so-called the representatives of Palestinian people, they make it an Islamic issue, whereas the left yep. in the West, yep. they see it as anti-colonial movement and local indigenous people fighting for their independence. They see it as that. In your opinion, first of all, I think I know your answer, but what is your opinion? What exactly it is? And secondly, how do you think Palestinian people can actually separate themselves from these Islamist propagandists like Dili Hussein and all these popular Islamist propagandists because they are hijacking your narrative. I know and I, and I appreciate that you that's when you decided to come and give your perspective. Do you think you're winning? Do you think there is hope or propagandists like Dili Hussein and hijabs and all, all of them? There's so many of them or, or they're controlling the narrative. Starting with your very early like first point, I speak for myself. I might be one of the few outspoken prominent voices but i promise you that i am absolutely far from alone and i talked to numerous palestinians who not only despise these voices but there are other palestinian and arab voices in amman and jordan and in beirut and in turkey especially in turkey and in qatar who are pontificating all of this garbage about jihad and about fisa bilillah and the, the 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 need to keep resisting and to push forward it's like there's tears of this horrible phenomenon of people outside of Gaza egging on the Palestinians to say, keep on with your jihad, keep on with the resistance, keep on with the decolonization efforts. What I say and what I share is those sentiments are absolutely held by so many people who don't want these individuals. And I'm trying really hard to not use, you know, pointed words here, but these individuals who think they can out Palestinian Palestinians. And I'll give you an example, man. And I'll, I'll, They're more Palestinian really personal, than you. And, These guys are more Palestinian. Exactly. And it's disgusting, you know? And again, we, I mean, I can understand, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a podcaster. You want to have conversations. I, I, I want to be transparent that my intention in calling this out isn't just to crap on the pro-Palestine movement. I want to see a robust and a thriving and a well-to-do Palestinian movement and pro-Palestine movement. And I think some of that requires calling out these horrendous voices that speak on our behalf, that Islamize the cause, that help dehumanize our people. And then when I, someone like myself or a few other voices dare deviate from this entrenched narratives, we're attacked and we're demonized and we're made to be assets and spies. So I'm going to tell you, you know, if you just allow me a couple of minutes, please, to share this personal example. So I've lost over 31 family members of mine in IDF and Israeli bombardment in our home. It has happened on October 13th, on October 25th, both of these two separate bombings in Gaza City, and then a much bigger, more destructive one on December 14th in Rafa in the south, where 28 people were killed in one particular strike in my mom's family home. And I wrote about this in Newsweek. I wrote about this in the Jewish Forward. Like, this is well documented and all out there. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, in between those two events, thank you, brother. In between those two events, I started, again, my voice started 
kind of coming online and gaining popularity and, and being noticed. And I was retweeted by Mahdi Hassan, and that got me hundreds of thousands of views and follows, or, or, or impressions, I should say. But I started listening to Gazans in Gaza, in the diaspora. I started writing about what are Gazans actually saying about Hamas? What are Gazans' views of the so-called resistance of Hamas? And I did a one particular thread that went really viral. It had 4 million views within a day about Hamas, and it was a 17th piece thread. After that, I swear to you, Harris, there was such a coordinated attack against me by self-described communists, okay? Those people with a hammer and sickle. Oh, yeah. Self-described Islamists, particularly in London and in the United States. There's a page called Muslim Matters. Look it up, Muslim Matters, and it's a blue check that has over 300,000 followers. These guys led such a horrendous attack against me. And because of them, I had hundreds of horrendous messages and threats and, and abuse in my inbox mm. saying that I am a spy. I'm a native agent. I am a... They pointed to... Zionist the shield. Because, you know... Exactly. I talk to everyone. I'm, I, I will talk to any and everyone. I don't care what your beliefs are. I want to get my message out there. I wrote for the Washington Institute for Near East Studies, which is a pro-Israel aligned think tank. They're pro-Israel, but there are some reasonable voices in there and they want to hear from a Palestinian. I'm not getting invited by the pro-Palestine think tanks that, to, to write, so I'll write for them. So they view that as evidence that I am bought for and paid for by the Zionists. Dig this. I used to have a, 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 I went on like a, like a tiny like Bay Area. I live in San Francisco Bay Area on a whale watching Bay Area trip. And my profile picture for months was of me just on the boat, like just, and it wasn't like even like I'm boating. It's just like, you can tell that I'm at the edge of a boat. And they turned that profile picture of a literal $50 whale watching trip into, I am this rich paid for by the rich Jews and the Zionists have given me millions of dollars to buy a boat and to crap on the, the resistance and to malign the resistance. So there was this alliance, I swear it was as if they were like in a centralized command room talking to each other, concurrent campaign against me, a guy who lost all of his family members in Gaza, from Gaza, saying, I want peace, I want coexistence, I'm largely deaf in my left ear from an Israeli bombing that almost killed me and it killed two of my friends. I have felt, I lived the Intifada, the Intifada is not the sexy revolution, it is death, it is destruction, it is harm we need peace and coexistence and we need a new path forward instead of this globalized the intifada crap these people launched these coordinated attacks against me to say that i am maligning the resistance that i must be a spy they pointed to the fact that i have a degree in national security and intelligence that i posted about openly out in the open i didn't hide it i have national security interests to try understand how the world security architecture works and they're like, oh my God, we have the smoking gun. We just went open. So we just went to his LinkedIn, which is open to the whole world, and we saw that he. The only thing they show Sherlock Holmes. They <laughs> they, like, they they find publicly listed information, and they think that oh, they've uncovered something. When it's like, bro, if I wanted to hide it, I wouldn't put it there. <laughs> you you're not Sherlock Holmes. Exactly. Exactly. I want to ask you. You have personally suffered so much. How come you did not become so hateful towards the idea of Israel? Because a lot of people say that if my family member is going to die, then of course I'm going to become another Hamas jihadi. I'm going to hate Israel. And this cycle of violence will never end. You might have seen that Elon Musk clip that went viral where he was talking about how for every Hamas soldier you kill, how many other Hamas soldiers you give birth to. So... How, how do you respond to that? Because I'm trying to work out whether there is any hope or not, because Israel cannot stop. And I, I, I don't want to admit that there's no end to the cycle of violence. So it is precisely the loss of my family members that motivates me to desperately pursue pragmatic, practical, pa different options and paths forward to break this cycle. Because, and I'm not saying I am going to single-handedly break this cycle, but I want to inspire others to get away from this one-dimensional vicious cycle of hatred, incitement, violence, revenge. 
rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. My connections with Israelis and Jews, not just through dialogue, but actual Israelis, I mean, across the spectrum, including even settlers in the West Bank. And I think settlements are immoral. I think they're wrong. I, I think they're hindered for too. peace. Yeah. But a settler literally transported medication. My dad, who was a UN doctor, in, an UNRWA doctor in Gaza, and he passed away four years ago from cancer, a settler helped physically transport the medication from Jerusalem close to the Gaza borders so that somebody else could pick it up and bring it inside Gaza. And she did that at a time when there were red alerts because there was there were a couple of errant rockets that came out of Gaza. When I came to the United States, an Israeli American doctor, neurologist helped me because I described I have permanent like almost I'm almost you're fully deaf in my left ear from the IDF bombing that at, at, when I was 11 in Gaza and it killed two of my friends. I have horrible ringing in my ears. I've, you know, station tube issues, blah, blah, blah. It's from the concussive impact of the blast wave hit me. An Israeli American doctor whom I met at a Jewish Palestinian dialogue group helped set me up with an MRI, a CAT scan, hearing tests, all sorts of care for free. And he worked out a miracle. I don't know how he did it because those things in America, if you don't have insurance, you're screwed. So, I've just been time and again, my, hearing my uncle in the 90s, my uncle who was killed by Israel, by the way, in the 90s. And the joke was that in, in the 1990s, Gazans occupied Israel because of how many day laborers were in there. And they weren't just like basic, you know, low level construction workers. They were working in factories and textiles and offices and like they were doing amazing work. And the relationships that he described with Israelis throughout Israel that he, other people that I know have described. So not only is peace and coexistence possible from his story, my story, but it is an imperative. It is an inevitability because neither side is going anywhere. Israel is not going to be dismantled as was the case in South Africa. And, and this is a cited, a commonly cited example that we're going to do to Israel what we did to South Africa. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. And I keep telling them, you got to actually, the sooner we realize that, I do believe in targeted boycotts or targeted sanctions, but not t boycotting anything Israeli just because it's Israeli or not talking to academics just because they're Israeli or not talking to mainstream groups just because they don't 100% subscribe to your anti-Zionist beliefs. Like you have to have engagement. You have to build alliances. You have to build bridges. So I absolutely believe that in the same way you were talking about the people, the survey and the people feeling the impact of the war and the consequences are the ones that don't support Hamas. For me personally, and I can promise you for many Gazans and Palestinians, they might just not say it out loud. They might not speak English. They might not have a lot of followings on Twitter. They might be afraid. They might be fearful. They don't might not want to be ostracized. But people who experience violence and its horrible consequences, yes, they can become potential recruits for terrorism or violence, but they can also be some of the most pro-peace or at least pro-different future. What would be the ratio, though? Because mm -hmm. I think you sound like an exception to me, because if I put myself in your shoes and I witness that someone who is supposed to be my enemy has killed 28 of my family members, has caused me real bodily harm, that is going to stay with me forever. I don't know if I would be as nice to them as you are. I, I just, I mean, you give me hope then that maybe you're a better person than me and maybe you're a better person than most people on earth. Am I being too pessimistic here or you think that there would be more people like you who would see this conflict like you do, despite suffering so I mean, it's hard to quantify. And like, I, it's, I mean, I, yes, it is incredibly difficult. And I will tell you personally, it takes a daily commitment to not give in to the rage and the hate. Like I keep saying, I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm furious. I'm livid. I'm fearful. I'm worried, but I'm not hateful. And that is different. I can be angry. We, you can address your anger and your anxiety and your fear. You can work on it. You can channel it. You can do all sorts of things with it, but hate you cannot channel it into something productive. You cannot hate just becomes this like cancer that, that consumes you from within. And I really mean this sincerely. I'm not virtue signaling. I'm not trying to, I don't, I'm not a Gandhi. I'm not a pacifist. I believe in 
the appropriate use of targeted violence at certain instances. My goal is to, even if it's not the norm, even though I genuinely believe there are many people, I talk to hostage families, I talk to my friend Maoz, who lost both of his parents on October 7th, he's Israeli, and he is one of the most incredible pro-peace, pro-coexistent voices out there right now. And he, he has a presence on, on, on Twitter. So I've seen it on the Israeli side. I know there are some voices within the Palestinian side that absolutely they may not love Israel for what it's did. And I'm not saying I'm in love. Like I will always have grievances with the IDF and why I believe my family was killed. And I believe it was done erroneously. And the children as young as two, three and four months old shredded, man. I will have grievances, okay? But those grievances are never going to be bolstered by more violence. They're never going to be addressed or resolved by... I feel that the only way I can honor my family's memory is to actually use, create a powerful voice that is pro-peace, that wants to turn the ship around. So whether it be because of just who I am personally, whether it be because I love i know i've studied a lot of conflict resolution i've studied buddhism buddhism and 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 buddhist philosophy i've studied islamic scholarly work that are specifically for promoting peace and and i try to pick up bits and pieces over the over the years from a variety of teachings and philosophies and examples and conflicts and i mean even looking at examples of people in the farc in colombia the farc rebels or the ira in northern ireland or even some of the plo that were politically rehabilitated there are examples of people that were involved in violence that call it social and political rehabilitation but just i this is really a key point i'm just i, I want to stay here just for a minute because i really genuinely believe that I could potentially inspire others to try and think similarly in terms of, okay, fine, don't love Israel. If they killed your family, that's okay. Have issues with Israel. That's fine. But don't also believe that somehow violence and revenge are going to actually do anything to bring back your family, to address the grievances, or to promote the Palestinian cause or the Muslim cause or whatever cause you believe in, however you identify this cause. And so more importantly, this is something that as a peace advocate, a lot of these crazy supposed pro-Palestine folks that are detrimental, whether it be the red triangles on Twitter, the Islamist in London or the US or the crazy self-described communists, they can attack me all they want, but they can never delegitimize me as someone from Gaza who has skin in the game, who has suffered and paid a lot of sacrifices. So their attempts at delegitimizing me only go so far. And then they have to shut up and they have to accept that I have a voice in this whole struggle and this whole fight and this whole cause that they can never fully drown out. And I'll tell you, Harris, I heard it firsthand from a few, even though some of these crazy folks do attack and send their hateful imbeciles to attack me, I've heard multiple, from multiple sources, that some of the big, and certainly in DC, in the United States, but also in London and other voices, they hate my guts. They can't stand me. But for the fact that my family, and I share and I show my family are Muslim, my family, they cover their heads up. I'm a Muslim, I'm from Gaza, and so many of my family members were killed. They feel that it would just harm them. They couldn't attack me. They couldn't, they couldn't delegitimize me. They couldn't say that, oh, Ahmed is some Western sellout guy, whatever. Yeah, this is my family, dude. You claim to be Muslim? Like, it's okay. So like, I want to normalize. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I want to normalize mainstream Muslim Gazan voices saying enough of this, enough of Hamas's Islamism, which is not Muslim. It's a corrupt political ideology. And we can be courageously calling for peace and a different path forward and not be considered traitors or sellouts. So they can't take that out away from me, these crazy Islamists. There. And I'm sorry, brother. I don't know. I, I know you come from a particular background, but there's something about, and, and, and again, there's some wonderful pro-peace, even like folks who are like, like folks from Pakistan and Bangladesh that I have talked to personally who have helped me connect with other pro-peace groups but there's something really from about pakistan as well uh, really so yeah some, yeah absolutely there's, good... there's my friend zainab khan over at mala it's an, a muslim uh organization okay. m-a-l-a but there's something nevertheless so per pervasive 
about some of these Pakistan diaspora folks from Pakistan and, and Bangladesh everywhere being thinking they're like gonna out Palestinian me and like I said so so I'll conclude with this because I do want no, to I want you to say to more on this point. I actually wanted you to say more. This Muslim diaspora, especially Pakistanis and Bangladeshis who think that they are more Palestinian than Palestinian people, they are waving the flag of Islamic Jihad and they are telling you, like, this, this photo that I showed you of your family members, like it, it always makes me a little bit emotional because look what they're going through. These are the people who are going through hell right now. They still have smile on their faces. But then we have, exactly. people, like, then we have people like D Dildo Hussein, people like them, they just keep islamizing this issue and they know mm -hmm. that it works and this is their own personal islamic fetish while these cowards they live in their western countries yet they glamorize the taliban they glamorize hamas they call them freedom fighters and they tell palestinian mm -hmm. people keep sacrificing your kids keep getting mm -hmm. them blown up we will keep talking about you that's what they keep doing so so let it out. I, I want to see you how you feel about these imbeciles. Well, when my family, when the massive attack on December 14th took place and 28 of my family members were killed and I published about it, I share pictures, I showed it, it, I had all the receipts there. These Islamists, they sent me and I have I have an archive. I, I've chosen not to reveal them, but like I have the screenshots. I have it all in my inbox. They said, oh, Ahmed, oh, we're, we feel bad for you. They didn't say... We're so sorry for the, your family's loss. Even though we still maintain that you're a spy and a traitor, we feel bad for you. I swear to God, Harris, they were like, we're going to do a two-week truce in not sharing the truth about you to give you enough time to grieve for your family. I swear to God, bro. So these giving me a truce, a ceasefire, these are, by the way, they're the, the very same people that are, that are screaming ceasefire now, ceasefire now. They held their own ceasefire with me. Let me guess they said, the breach. We, we're Let gonna... me guess they breached their own ceasefire as well. Uh, it, it, thank you. Thank you very much. That's exactly why. Because they thought, okay, Ahmed, after the death of his family, now they were like, and there were other people, not just the, 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 the diaspora, you know, folks that were described. There were other people in the pro-Palestine movement who were like, Ahmed, your story is so powerful. You've lost so many family members. We would love it. It's just come, just throw your hat in and just we'll put you in front of protests. We'll put you on every show there is. You're well-spoken. You're well-written. You speak perfect English. You're from Gaza. You are the perfect guy for us. We need you. Our people, like basically is the other side of tokenization. Some pro-Israel people want to tokenize me when I criticize Hamas, but these guys, they want to token Gazan that lost dozens of his family members so that they can put me in front of demonstrations and they're like oh we tr and you'll speak right whatever so they thought that after my family were killed that i would go all in and just be like all right screw it you know what you guys are right from the river to the sea get rid of Z their, you know all of palestine by all means violent resistance is great hamas is great i love hamas that's what they thought i would do after the death of my family and then within about 10 days or so i doubled down on saying Hamas, the criminals are leading our people to a, a to slaughter. They need to stop. They need to release the hostages. I, I became much more pointed. I, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal that I published in which that kind of like I started a massive counteroffensive. I, I, I'm going to call it my own counteroffensive against Hamas and the folks who normalize Hamas. And so these Islamists, and I have their names and I have all of them, and there were dozens and dozens of them, they breached their own truce with me. They breached their own ceasefire. They were like, oh, well, actually, now that you're back to maligning the resistance, that's the word they said, maligning the resistance. Now we're going to unfortunately have to go back to exposing you for the native agent that you are. And then that page, Muslim Matters, I don't know if you had it, if you have a chance to bring it up, bring it up, please. Muslim Matters, it's a blue check mark, and it has 300,000 followers. That's their Facebook page. If you bring it up on, on Twitter, please. And their head guy, whom I think fits the demographic that we're speaking, I can't remember exactly who he is, but he went out of his way and I called him. I used his own. I said, you're a monafiq, you know, which is a hypocrite in Islam. You can't say you're pro-Palestine and you're pro... These guys. Yes, these guys. I swear, Harris, I... 
they sent some of the worst. I don't know if they deliberately sent them or just because they posted something in here. Some of the worst abuses that I got after my freaking family were killed were the hands of people that I genuinely think were directed by Muslim Matters to send me horrible messages. And again, that's not to say every single one of them is bad. I'm angry. I'm upset about this because they have caused me at a time when I was grieving. These people caused me so much suffering. And then they turn around. Yeah. And they love to share everything that is pro-Palestine. So that frustrates me. That hurt me. That will stay with me. Even though I, I want to be clear also, some pro Israel people were absolute jerks and horrible and horrible in, in mocking the death of my family, like a few, but a huge number of Jews and, and Israelis were in, like incredibly forthcoming in how we're so sorry. May their memory be a blessing. That's a Jewish saying. They always say, may their memory be a blessing. It's interesting that you said that how they categorize it. You are maligning the resistance and you were basically speaking mm -hmm. about releasing the hostages. You were condemning Hamas. You obviously being a Palestinian someone who has personally suffered a lot you have a skin in the game as you said so basically simply speaking up for people who have been held hostage by hamas even that is condemnable in in their opinion it's fascinating but i i, I want to move on to the idf's response now you have personally suffered a lot at the hands of the idf you, you just said yourself that you have griev grievances with israel as well and understandably so and you still don't hold any hatred towards them and you want to find a way forward after october 7 israel responded actually let me ask this question do you think what israel is doing in gaza can be classified as genocide as these muslim propagandists say I think there have been some genocidal statements that were made by senior ranking Israeli ministers. I yeah. think they're talking about the transfer of Gazans, talking about their no innocence. I think there was a lot of rhetorical, like, yeah. genocidal statements. I think even Benjamin Netanyahu be quoting the Amalekites. Now, that's a genocidal statement. Multiple things are true at once. Do I think this is a textbook example of what genocide is? No, I don't. Because not only could have. Israel can do a lot more damage and, and killing. But, I mean, Israel is basically, at least ostensibly so, trying to be targeted in its effort, even though I dispute a lot of that targeting. And we'll get to that in a second. But, but just on this very issue, I think there are people with genocidal intent, including people in power, genocidal statements, mm -hmm. and sheer incitement after one of the worst days that Jews have experienced since the Holocaust, that the, the October 7th massacre. I think the IDF's actions have entailed war crimes, including the killing of my family who are unarmed civilians, uninvolved. I have kept up with my family. There is no documented presence of Hamas. I use, you know, I'm an intelligence and national security dude. Like I know how to use open source. Like there's no documented presence of Hamas in or around the, the houses, especially in Rafah, where my folks were killed. And this was before any of the military operations. There was bombardment, but this was like when Rafah was largely quiet. It was near the house was near the borders with Egypt. It was away from the any documented launches of rockets whatsoever. I want to understand this bit. How much truth there is in Israeli claims that they drop pamphlets, they send text messages, they lose the element of surprise because they want to minimize civilian casualties and they tell you we're going to be conducting bombings or raids here so you can go, but then Hamas doesn't let them go. How much truth is in, in that claim? multiple truths. There, I think, I mean, I think historically in the past, Israel used to do a lot of phone calls, but those have been largely absent from this war. There are some phone calls that are made to certain areas, not to say we're about to bomb, which is what you, they used to do, but to say leave, head elsewhere, etc. They throw these pamphlets, but unfortunately, it's not as simple as we just let you know that we're going to bomb somewhere and then you're supposed to magically leave and pick up. I mean, talk about logistically, talk about, yes, Hamas has in fact try to undermine basically because they want the civilians to be there. They want to hide behind the civilians. So they have not physically prevented the civilians from leaving per se, but they obfuscate the information. They said to people, oh, don't worry about it. This is just propaganda. So multiple things are true. However, 
there are numerous, most strikes against homes, against specific homes, including in areas that were deemed safe zones, where my family were killed, where the largest number of them were killed, did not see any amount of warning. They were in Rafa, which is supposed to be a safe place. And so either it was bad intelligence, either it was uh, a mistake, either, or God, for, as somebody said, God, for, an Israeli friend of mine who is close to the IDF, said, God forbid, maybe it was deliberate, maybe it was an errant bomb, maybe it could, it seemed targeted, yet it also seems so random. So Hamas, and I have a piece coming out very soon that talks about the origin of the Hamas human shields, mm. which actually, again, these conversations are so freaking difficult to have online because there's a lot of nuance. Israel does have a lot of propaganda stuff. There's also a lot of truth to some of this propaganda. Hamas has a lot of propaganda stuff or some of the pro-Palestine folks, but there's some truth to that. So, for example, the idea of human shields, just briefly, isn't that Hamas physically holds somebody and says, OK, like, I, you know, I want you to be in front of me so that if the Israelis, you know, like the idea of the human shield is that Hamas embeds itself based on a on a discovery they made in 2006. And that's where I, I quote the origin of the strategy. So you're getting a sneak peek into this piece that's going to be published soon. A Hamas leader discovered that by when Israel would call homes of militants that were about to be bombed in Gaza, they send hundreds of uninvolved civilians to the rooftop and to populate the whole building so that basically Israel would have to commit a massacre of hundreds of people at once. And the IDF would on on a couple of occasions early on in 2006 would call off these airstrikes so this became a strategy that hamas adopted saying okay it wasn't so much so basically you're telling me that the idf would see that the people that they have alerted they've lost the element of surprise they've said evacuate the region and then hamas would use that as oh okay how do i save my fighters well they would fill it up with Palestinian people. And Israel, that is so evil, that wants to commit a genocide, that wants to kill as many Palestinians as possible, they would call off the strike because we're like, well, that's just too many people. We, we don't want to kill that many Palestinians. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean you, can, you, might, you might make your own inferences from it, but I think generally speaking, that's why I said... That's what it means. This is the reason why they've stopped calling. Because they're like, hang on a second, you're going to put more civilians there. Well, so so so, so th there's some of that, but I think some of it also. I mean, because of a mass war here, I don't think every home that was being warned was would happen. This wouldn't happen all the time. This strategy, this happened at specific times. And the guy Nizar Rayyan, the the Hamas leader who invented this strategy, he was actually killed on in January first, two thousand nine. And the strategy, he got warning. He had four wives, of course. He got warned by Israel, by the Shin Bet, to leave, and he didn't. And so he had his wives and 12 of his children were killed with him. So he held his own kids and family hostage and got him killed along with himself. Is that a martyrdom fetish? It, they, that's why they use the word death cult, you know, when they say we love death more than you love life or something like that. The essence of life is building and living and constructing and creating and developing. But to Hamas, the essence of life in, in, in their twisted mind is martyrdom as this gentleman had just said. So unfortunately, then what this strategy ended up doing is Hamas started as time went on, as they became more entrenched in Gaza, and as they saw that we can force Israel into a situation where it has to kill so many innocent Palestinians, that is a way of basically delegitimizing Israel and placing international pressure on Israel. So then they started you know, placing, proliferating their infrastructure throughout different areas and civilian neighborhoods and business areas and, and near you know, sensitive civilian infrastructure. And so again, there's truth to the fact that, the, that unfortunately the, the Israeli military now, anytime it commits you know, a, a horrible killing, it makes a mistake. Hamas made it so easy for the Israeli military to say, well, Israel, Hamas holds Israel, uh, Gazans hostages and we're forced to operate in an impossible environment, which there's some truth to that. But unfortunately, that has now become 
a way for Israel to basically say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're not going to admit that we made a mistake. So again, multiple things are true, but I absolutely feel compelled to be honest intellectually and personally. Yes, Gazans are held hostage by Hamas politically, metaphorically, and militarily in the way that Hamas conducts itself. They view themselves as a legitimate resistance group. They're a people's militia, and that grants them carte blanche to be able to operate wherever they want. And I know personally of people, I helped one of them apply for asylum, and I'm not going to mention his name, from Gaza, who went out to Hamas when they were getting ready to fire rockets. This was in the 2014 war. Getting ready to fire rockets. They were setting up the launchers. And he said, guys, come on, please. Because we know what happens. You shoot the rocket, the Israeli intelligence assets pick it up, they come and they wipe out the whole area. So he was like, guys, please, can you just go, just go down the street? Just go fire further. You're going to get me killed. You're right. And they threatened him. And they said, if you don't shut up, we're going to kill you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And that happened with people, for example, who discover that tunnels are being dug underneath their homes or underneath their businesses. They feel vibrations. They feel things happening. So, again, the way that Hamas operates regularly, slightly inadvertently, but largely deliberately puts Gazans at risk because Hamas's strategy relies on Israel causing maximum suffering to the civilians in Gaza. And then that in turn will both delegitimize Israel and make it look horrible, which it often does. Both. And it also will get pressure on Israel to stop it. And it will also motivate Gazans against Israel to fight against Israel. Certainly. Yeah. C certainly. So, 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 but just to, to, to conclude, I, I want to go back to that because it's a very sensitive point and, and, and a lot of people have been, have attacked me for not, regularly saying it's a genocide it's a genocide look again i believe what happened to my family is a war crime and it's unjustified and even unless you show me the receipt that the you know senoir's deputy was underneath my family's home to justify killing 28 people in one strike man with children and women and elderly and people sheltering in there that that's unjustified and whether it was a mistake whether it was bad intelligence that still is a war crime in my opinion However, even though I think some of the deplorable acts of some IDF soldiers in mocking Gazans, I think there are a lot of room for immense criticisms. Yeah. Do I think it's a Rwandan style genocide? I don't. Now, can it evolve to become a genocide? Can it be something different six to 12 months from now? Who knows? But as of now, I don't believe that it is helpful to, that's the thing with a lot of the pro-Palestine folks, or even with Hamas, like they can't just say, the Israeli side, you know, when I say, and I would talk in Arabic, I would say the Israeli side, the Hamas guy is, they're like, the Zionist murderous killing, like they throw all these adjectives that weaken, the Zionist entity murderous killing, blah, 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 blah. Show don't tell. Show the acts, the horrible acts that Israel is doing, but I don't know why the obsession with insisting on calling it a genocide. But once again, I will say, to be intellectually honest, of course, there are some horrendous statements by senior Israeli leaders. I've talked to folks in the Israeli government itself, senior people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who tell me how a lot of the rank and file, even within the IDF, even within the different the ministries, they think that these statements by Smotrich and Ben Veer and the Katz and the other guy, the heritage minister, who said maybe a nuclear bomb is an option, like to transferring yeah. voluntary transfers. We're going to build settlements in Gaza. I think those are absolutely genocidal intent. But those people are not solely capable of carrying out a genocide. Yeah, but and Israel again, as a state, Israel as a state is not doing that. Or until it does that, we can't call it genocide. And I think the reason why they call it a genocide certainly. is because obviously it's propaganda. I, I remember as soon as the IDF's retaliation began, we started hearing these uh, shrieks of genocide when the number of casualties was only at about 5,000 people. And I kept asking, hang on a second, I, I get it that you're trying to alert the world. I get it. You're trying to tell people that, look, what the, the, there is a tragedy taking place right before our eyes. I get it. But I think throwing big words like genocide, I think that demeans the suffering of Palestinian people because people say, well, 5,000 people out of the population of 2.2 million, you either don't know the definition of genocide 
Well, you're just a propagandist. So why should I pay attention to it? Is there a reduction in violence? Or it's just that people just move on. Like you, you show them enough brutality, then they just get desensitized to it. Or, or, or there's genuinely less violence in the last few months or so. Unfortunately, we are stuck with Al Jazeera Arabic, which is largely a Hamas propaganda arm. Basically, mm -hmm. it's the Hamas arm that always starts the broadcast either with the horrendous scenes of the deaths, which I think that makes sense. Like start, yes, document the deaths and the atrocities, or more often with, oh, Hamas shot an RPG at a tank here with the red triangles, you know, the horrible crap oh, yeah. that Hamas has normalized on social media. Well, or Hamas has fired a couple of small, you know, mortar rounds. I don't like, see those videos anymore. Al Jazeera, even today. I don't see those videos anymore. I think they... I, I, I see that I see them in Arabic, but they're few and far in between because Hamas has both lost a lot of military assets, but also Hamas is pulling back right now because they want to survive because they've lost a lot of their fighters. Not every like I mean, I think there is the IDF exaggerates the extent to which it has destroyed Hamas. Nevertheless, Hamas as a cohesive fighting military, if you will, armed group the structures that it had are significantly weakened. I read your tweet they, about how the whole chain of commands has just fully disintegrated in Gaza. De yeah, decentralized. Now, it's decentralized small units, right? Now, the small now, militias operating on say, their own. Exactly. Now, that's not to say that in the future, Hamas can't regroup these folks. But that's the challenge. I'll tell you something, Harris. And this has been, I talked to a couple of friends of mine from Gaza who are here in the Bay Area. And... We had this discussion, man, and like why I haven't called for like the traditional ceasefire, even though my surviving family, my brother and his family, they're on the floor. I mean, I, I genuinely like absolutely I want a ceasefire. I want the violence to stop. I want the war to end. I want them to survive. My nieces and nephews are on the floor. This is horrible of epic proportions. The issue that I have kept trying to push the pro-Palestine folks to try to elevate this is, OK, you got to go beyond just a meaningless call for a ceasefire, which we've been calling for a ceasefire for five months and it hasn't gone anywhere. You got to, A, pair the call for a ceasefire with the release of the hostages mm. because those are human beings and that is a huge sickening issue. And I've talked to families of hostages. I've talked to a couple of former hostages, yes, that were released. And and they're, just their willingness to engage and build bridges and, and talk to a Gazan with skin in the game. And one of them specifically sought me out because she wanted to talk to a Gazan who has lost family members and to try to build bridges. And I thought that was beautiful, you know? She has more humanity as a woman who was held by Hamas than these pro-Palestine, sorry, London Brits that, you know, the Islamists, the pro-Hamas Islamists. Like, a literal survival, surviving hostage this... had more empathy towards me than some of the pro-Palestine people. That, that, I, I don't even, I want to start calling people alleging to be pro-Palestine, people using the Palestinian cause. Isn't that shameful, man? It is, it, Isn't it is. that shameful? And this is the reason why nobody takes them seriously, because on the one hand, they pretend to be these great humanist people who are speaking for the suffering of Palestinian people. But then on the other hand, they have absolutely nothing to say about what happened on October 7th, about the hostages. They genuinely believe that it is a legitimate action taken by... Hamas. And if you ask for a ceasefire and then you don't ask for the release of the hostages, then how can I take you seriously? Because you're basically telling me that it's okay for your guys to kill the other guys, but it's not okay for them to retaliate. Um, and I think this is what's Certainly. terribly broken. And, and that's why your voice is so much saner. But more importantly, just on that point, and this is the key point, and that's why I've been writing for all these outlets and foreign policy and others. And like, just I've written L to try and come up with pragmatic solutions for the humanitarian side of the things. But also, this has to be Gaza's final war. We cannot have a ceasefire. I, I, again, I want a ceasefire immediately right now. Guys, don't come after me, please. And we have to have this become like a launching point for political transformation in Gaza that sees Hamas no longer in control that sees a different professional administration that can provide for Gazans instead of keeping Gazans aid dependent and keeping them alive through handouts by UNRWA and by the international community. I mean, Gaza has an oil field, a, a gas field off its shore. 
that it could use to, to, to develop itself and to prosper. Gaza overlooks the Mediterranean and it, it, it can have an airport like it once did. I flew in Gaza's short-lived airport, which was there from 98 to 2000. I flew into Gaza. Mm. And flying into Gaza. Can you even, have you ever thought of even saying those words together? Flying into Gaza. Gaza had an airport. That was during the Oslo peace process that Hamas specifically sought to destroy and undermine with its suicide bombings. It's like all of these folks don't know anything about Hamas. They just, their whole shtick is Israel bad. Fine, criticize Israel, but understand that Palestinians have had a role, Palestinian leadership, Palestinian organizations, the Arabs in the 1950s and 60s, the Palestinian national movement, the secular movement with the PLO and all the, you know, the thuggery in Jordan and, and in Lebanon, or now the Islamist horrible stuff. Like, you can't just say this is all solely the product of Israel and no one else had any role whatsoever in getting the Palestinians where they're at. So, so I want Gaza to be transformed. I want a ceasefire that gets us somewhere else where Gaza becomes a hub of art and culture and economic development. And it becomes a role model for Palestinian statehood and sovereignty and control and governance. We have smart people. The Palestinians are some of the most educated among the Arab population. We just, we need to do what we can with the land that we have instead of sabotaging, you know, Gaza could have been the crown jewel of, of the Middle East, not Singapore or whatever. I don't care about it being Singapore or Hong Kong, but Gaza could have been a crown jewel of the Palestinian state. And it could have shown, look, Israel, if you withdraw the settlements in, in the West Bank, this is what will happen. This is, we are capable. And instead, Hamas turned it into a resistance citadel. A backward whereby insulated, Yeah, and it insulated itself from the blockade while letting its people face the consequences of violence and, and poverty. Last question. You've covered pretty much most of it, what it could have been. But now I want to know what is likely going to happen. Israel, hopefully, in the final stage of its military operation, I've been listening to all the other military experts and they all say that Israel would not be able to fully destroy or dismantle uh, Hamas. But I think mm -hmm. the goal was always to weaken it to a point where it cannot carry out an attack like it did on the October 7th. And in the meantime, hopefully, as you said, we would have some sort of a political movement on the front of this long-standing dispute. That's the hope, I guess. What is, in your opinion, going to happen once this conflict is over? Gaza, as you said, is sitting on uh, gas reserves. It could have been the crown jewel of the Middle East, not Singapore, or maybe let's just the UAE, or whatever. Like it, it could be a prosperous, successful country if we could change the mindset of certain Palestinians. Or do you think there is going to be a, cha a major change in the Palestinian mindset that, okay, you know, we've had enough. We've had so many of our people killed. Let's just focus on this. Let's just give up this idea of these idiot Western leftist, wokeist communists and Muslim diaspora who've got nothing to do with Palestine. They have no skin in the game other than the Islamic fetish of conquering Jerusalem. We can throw this chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free away. And let's focus on what mm -hmm. we've got. Let's become a democracy. Gaza is not a democracy. I, I'm not blaming Palestinian people for it, but let's just call it what it is. It's not a democracy. Of course. But, but if it could become a democracy, then do you think we could... And, and do you think that Israel could actually change? It could soften its approach on the blockade or whatever you want to call it, uh, or on the occupation? Do you think it could change? And I think in that case, the West would be in a better position to force Israel to go easy on Palestine. So you have a lot of things moving there, but I'll, I'll try to compartmentalize as best as possible. The first of them is I absolutely think that after this horrendous war that was entirely avoidable, this was an entirely avoidable war. Thousands of Palestinians would be alive if Hamas had kept its fighters at home on October 7th. This did not have to happen, okay? And I genuinely, and also, this is not going to get all of the Palestinian prisoners released from Israeli jails like Hamas alleged at the beginning of the war. 
This is not going to change anything in Jerusalem or the Aqsa Mosque. This is not going to undo occupation in the West Bank. So, like, the Palestinian people are not stupid. They might, some might be misguided, or but they're not stupid. They're going to see that this, all of this was for nothing, pretty much. And Israel is a powerful country. You can try to delegitimize it all you want, but pragmatically speaking, it has unlimited Western and U.S. support mainly. And it is a powerful enough nation to stand on its own to persevere through this just as it has in the past. So yes, a lot of people will, Israel's reputation has suffered gravely, but Israel is not going anywhere because people perceive it as having killed a lot of innocent Palestinian civilians. So I genuinely believe that the people of Gaza, including even people who are, for a variety of reasons, connected to Hamas or were connected to Hamas or were supporters of the resistance, which is specifically referring to armed resistance, which is specifically referring to Hamas. So I genuinely believe that the seeds for transformation have been sown just in terms of people saying, all right, khalas, this is the Arabic word for we're done, khalas. Anjad, seriously, khalas. We don't want any more wars. We don't want any suicidal adventures. We don't want any you know, of, of, of Gaza becoming a, a resistant citadel. And I tell a lot of Palestinian folks that Unfortunately, there is just this, maybe it's just ideological. It's such an intransigent unwillingness to understand that when Hamas won the elections and said, we're not going to renounce violence or we're not going to, we're, we're going to keep fighting Israel, we're going to keep, and they were supposed to become now part of a governing body that was built on the Oslo process, which is built on recognizing Israel and renouncing violence. So they wanted to both govern and be a resistance group. You can't do both. You got to choose. When they did that, and then they took over Gaza, and then said explicitly, just like they're saying now, oh, well, we're going to do October 7th again and again, even though we know they can't. But they're just, it's like a chicken that's about to be slaughtered, and it's still just kicking up its feet and saying, well, I'm going to do it once again. You know, it's like this. And maybe some of it is just like this. It's delusion. Hamas kept saying delusion. Exactly. And also there's something to be said about just the tough mentalities of Arab mentalities and Gaza mentalities, you know, like that is a thing. But the, the, so, so when you say I'm going to keep shooting rockets, I'm going to attack Israel, I'm going to kill this, I'm going to get and you take over a territory like Gaza and you seek to smuggle things in. I mean, that's when. The blockade took place. Now, the blockade, unfortunately, there were times of it when it was horrible, like when Israel literally calculated the number of calories needed to be allowed in to allow. But at the same time, Hamas found ways to insulate itself from the blockade through smuggling, through Iranian support, later on through Qatari support. So the people, the civilians in Gaza suffered the poverty and the consequences. And that's one of my critiques of UNRWA, even though I maintain, even though they have a lot of issues. I think they did a lot of life-saving work, and that's why the IDF let them operate for years and years. But UNRWA indirectly enabled Hamas to wash its hands from providing for people by saying, oh, well, this is the UN's responsibility. We can't do it because of resistance, and you know we're under a blockade, you know, kind of like the Cuban government for decades justified all of its you know, horrible repression of people or horrible economic conditions, saying, oh, well, it's the blockade, you know, so... so if that is removed from the equation, if we say, all right, halas, Gaza is no longer going to be a citadel for resistance. Gaza is going to be a peaceful place whereby we're going to focus on governance, developing civil society. We're going to have democratic representation, but democratic representation in the sense of the will of the people to what they want to do rather than we're going to let Hamas run in elections again. Hamas should absolutely not be allowed to run in elections because they cannot, they are inherently undemocratic. Islamism is inherently undemocratic. And that's what Islamists did after the Arab Spring. They must absolutely be shunned from the democratic process. And I know a lot of, you know, liberal Westerners will take issue with this. I don't care. I don't care. We lived it. Again, we lived it in Gaza. This is the outcome of... President Bush was warned in 2006 that if you do elections right now, Hamas is going to win. And, you know, and the United States said, well, let's just keep doing it. Let's get it. Going. And then when the election results came out, they were like, OK, well, let's actually like sanction them. Whatever. Well, why did you push for elections in the first place? As OK, so that's part one. Part two, 
I gen no part part one is I think people don't want any more war. Part two is why is there a blockade? And if you remove the explicit intent to attack Israel and try to kill Israelis from Gaza, then over time the need for the blockade erodes, and there will always you know for the foreseeable future, of course, the trauma and like Israel is always going to have some kind of security checks and controls. But I think over time that can absolutely be lessened to allow Gaza to develop. Finally, as to what will actually happen, and for me, this is the biggest problem, and this is the biggest worry, is that Gaza is going to be fragmented in the sense that Israel is going to maintain some kind of a military presence in there, which that in and of itself is going to be is going to have terrible consequences. And I've written about this on Twitter. I was just interviewed for Voice of America. Like, I a military occupation will worsen resentment, will elicit some kind of a an armed resistance it basically gives new life for why there needs to be armed resistance so at a time like fine go around gaza do a buffer zone use your surveillance whatever but to be inside gaza i think would be a horrible mistake but all indications point that for now israel is going to maintain a physical presence inside gaza the other thing that worries me about is that i worry about is a mutation of remnants of hamas I think Hamas politically is probably going to go down a political process that entails a gradual softening of their stance, even though they might not initially say, I think Hamas potential, and I've said this oh, because again, I, I want to be intellectually honest. I said, we should look at rehabilitating what remains of Hamas politically and administratively per the Irish model, the Northern Irish model, per the FARC rebels per even the Palestinian Authority coming out of the violent PLO once they renounce violence. But I worry about those fighters that have guns, they have trainings, they have some access to the tunnels that are still intact. If they break away from Hamas and they form a horrible mutation, and if they, you know, it's like we we had Al-Qaeda right after 9-11, and years later we had ISIL, which was a horrible, even more brutal mutation. Still equally horrible, of course, but like just the sheer brutality and the capability and the, you know, and they were battle hardened. So like you have a lot of battle hardened Hamas members with a lot of training and guns that Israel is not going to be able to eliminate entirely. But Can Israel, those people, what do we do with those people? Well, Israel claims that the last stronghold of Hamas's fighters is Rafah. Should Israel carry out an operation there? Obviously not without or before moving all those uh, Palestinian civilians out of the harm's way. What is your opinion on that? Now we're seeing more and more Western governments putting pressure on Israel as well not to go ahead with this. Don't you think that Hamas is going to use these indications from certain Western countries as, hey, look, we have awakened the world. Now you and the world is standing by this resistance and Israel is finally beginning to lose, at least on the propaganda front. I mean, I think that would be, I understand, I wholeheartedly understand the question and, and the sentiment you're explaining. I think that's honestly like giving them way too much credit. Like they're not that sophisticated in terms of translating those calls by Western governments to protect civilians into actual tactical victories. I think on the one hand, like I said, like me personally as Ahmed and many Gazans, I absolutely... I'm not going to shed any tears for Hamas being destroyed and it losing all of its fighting capabilities. That I think that'll ultimately be a net positive gain for the Palestinian cause and people. I am incredibly skeptical that can be solely achieved through a military operation in, in Rafah, simply for a variety of reasons. Number one is there's still assets of Hamas that are, in fact, emerging in the north. And, and while Hamas has lost a lot of its capabilities, the group's tunnels are not fully understood, and it is believed that they can still have access to the north. Um, the, 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 the connectivity between the, the north and the south are such that Hamas can shift some of its resources and people out of Rafah. Through tunnels? Through the tunnels, yes. But yes. Haven't and, they destroyed some Israel of the tunnels? They would, have disrupted, they would have disrupted some of that network because uh, the north has been under the IDF's control for a while now. So you, you still reckon that they could still take Sinwar and all these other people could just get out of there? And that operation in Rafah would be of no use? I, I think to some extent, yes, absolutely, I do. And, and that's not to say that the operation in Rafah wouldn't further weaken Hamas. It would. 
But if you think about the humanitarian suffering and the cause, my brother in Rafa right now with his four kids and his team at the NGO that he works with, they got a house in central Gaza to now flee once again. My brother has fled seven times and each time their home was hit and the place that we're, they were at was hit. And now they got a new place and they want to head back up north to the center. But now Deir el Balah in the center is being hammered for a week now, unprecedented like not like none before. So why is it that the Israeli military and, then, and the government said, oh, well, now people can start leaving Rafah and heading up north only to increase the tempo in, in the center? I don't understand. There seems to be this incoherent, for example, also like telling people go to the coast in the center, to the beaches. Well, it's freezing cold. There are no tents. There's no water. There's no food. There's nothing. What, you just want to squeeze hundreds of thousands of people to the beaches with no infrastructure? When... The United States and the senators like Israel, the Arabs, the UN, they could have been building these alternate all along. They could have been building these alternate shelters for Gazans on the coast so that once you knew you were going to reach a Garafa, you could easily shift them up, up there. And I've even drawn maps and I've talked to people at different corporations and people who are satellite analysts to help me even do like a topography analysis of where can we put temporary shelters. And I've sent those ideas to the IDF. I've sent those ideas to the United States and the Department of Defense. And there just is such a like dysfunctional, like lack of organization within the IDF that they are not thinking beyond, you know, like a five, to, like five to 10 days out. You reckon it's dysfunctional or just not caring about Palestinian civilians at all? I, I think it's both. I, I honestly, I think it's both. But what I if and I, I talked to I've tons of Israeli friends. And I swear to them, they are the first to tell me like our media is, hor our media arms is horrible. Our media strategy is, there's a lot of dysfunction, but also there's a lot of interference. I mean, the IDF are professional, but there's a lot of interfer political interference by the Netanyahu government, by the right wingers within the Smotrich and the Ben Gvirs. But so, and I talked to an Israeli lady, let's just say, that is trying to help the IDF with the humanitarian stuff. And she was like, well, they can't, they don't, there's a political directive to not be seen as being too helpful to the Palestinian civilians because that's inconsistent with the political message domestically, which is showing resolve. We're going after the people that caused this October 7th. So therefore, a lot of, you know, these efforts to try and help Gaza civilians, they either have to be led by somebody other than the IDF. Or they have to be seen, they have to be done in a way where the IDF isn't seen as too caring. I swear, those were her words, man. So that's the problem, man. Is like, Why I, is that? I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, that I, wouldn't that wouldn't that make them look good, though? Wouldn't that serve their military purpose? It would serve them with the international community, but not with the domestic audiences, oh, unfortunately, yeah, oh, yeah, due okay. to the incitement. So they view themselves as, well... The leadership, the political leadership feels that it is more accountable to the domestic base than it is to the international base. And I would argue, and a lot of Israelis tell me that you can't, you can try to do both, mm. but to neglect how you appear to the international community is equally damaging in the long term and strategically. Yeah, and, and this is the reason why Benjamin Netanyahu, he made, he made that horrible speech and gave that biblical reference of Amalekites, which is specifically about killing even their animals. You know, that that is as genocidal as it gets. Like, I'm not a biblical scholar, but even I knew of that biblical verse because it's been used as, look how bad the Old Testament was. I, I can't thank you enough for coming and talking to me because I've been meaning to talk to a pro-Palestinian voice for a very long time but as i said very few pro-palestinian voices like yourself that are sane i really hope that your voice gets amplified and i still have so many questions and look i, I think i might invite you again we'll see how this Absolutely. one goes it's been an absolute pleasure and i'm so glad that your voice is increasing you're getting more and more followers and you're writing in financial review i think wall street journal you're writing for these major publications and I hope your voice just keeps on increasing because I think it's about bloody time that the Palestinian people separate themselves from these leftist commies and these Islamists living their cushy lives in Western countries and tell them, absolutely, go get lost, go do whatever you want with your 
Islamism or with your ideologies. We, the people of Palestine, are not here to fulfill your Islamic fetishes or desires of capturing Jerusalem and in the process keep sacrificing our kids. I, I really hope, and I think that's the only way forward, and I think your voice says that pretty much. Any last words? No, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. And I'm, I will talk to anyone. Your, I think your voice and the space that you occupy is key. And I want to just like end on a, like I said, a positive note. I mean, I talked to so, I was just talking just real quickly to this doctor, this Muslim doctor who is covered up in a hijabi and a committed devout Muslim who follows me on Twitter. And she's almost, she's 39. She makes a ton of money. And she was like, dude, like, I love what you're saying. Please keep doing it. Please keep saying it. I have a hard time. And she lives here in Los Angeles. She's like, man, my family have gone crazy on Hamas. And like a lot of the people in my circles or even the white allies have gone all in on, on just the, like the, the, the narrative that I try to tell them anything about Hamas and they immediately shut me down and they immediately attack me. And, and, and they immediately, there was this other guy in Jordan, Jordania, who, was to, who told me that, man, every time I want to criticize Hamas, even though I'm like, he's like, I'm super pro-Palestine. Like, I'm all in for Palestine, but I try to criticize Hamas and say, guys, like these guys are horrible. These guys are slaughtering Palestinians. They're using them as shields. They're, they're, wake up. He's like, I get mauled. So, and I talk to people in Gaza. We've seen the protests in Gaza. Like I said, I think it's a scandal, unfortunately, that I am one of the few prominent pro-Palestine, pro-peace, anti-Hamas voices in the Western world and in the English speaking world from Gaza and from the land. There are a lot of people that are, you know, Palestinian, etc. But I find that troubling. And yet it makes me feel that this is the more reason why I need to do it. It's very vital. It's very important. And just to, to the positive note that I really want to leave you on and, and the folks, the, the, the audience, I speak for myself. I operate solo. That gives me a lot of power, a lot of freedom. I'm a single dude. I don't have family here. I can say whatever I want and I can take care of my safety and my well-being. But there are nevertheless numerous Palestinians, especially in Gaza. Don't listen to the folks out in the diaspora, especially in Gaza who think that peace and coexistence are inevitable, who despise Hamas, who despise, and even Palestinians in the diaspora who can't speak out, they're fearful, they don't want to be ostracized, they don't have all the information, they haven't done their homework, and so they feel like they can't win a discussion or a debate. And so there are many people that hold my sentiments, but they're just fragmented, they're spread out, and they don't have the ability to speak out. It doesn't excuse them not speaking out, in my opinion, to a certain degree. Like, I'm willing to understand why they don't speak out. But I think we are reaching a point of no return where our people are going to absolutely lose any hope of having life, liberty, freedom, unless we start speaking out. So I want to normalize that. I, it's okay. I'm taking the beating, and I take a lot of beating from both sides, but especially a lot of folks from the pro-Palestine side. Nevertheless, there are also a lot of people that are slowly and gradually. But there are Israelis that tell me, you helped me as an Israeli humanize Gaza, see mm -hmm. Palestinians as human. You've helped me come down from my like crazed state after October 7th. Hundreds of such messages. You've helped me believe peace is hope as possible. Similarly, there are also Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims who tell me, you know what? You're right, man. I never thought that about Hamas, but doesn't mean they're going to speak out. Doesn't mean they're going to create a big Twitter following. But I believe people are waking up. It's slow. It's cru excruciatingly slow, but I'm hopeful. And I appreciate your role in helping amplify that, 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 that voice of mine. I really do. Well, thank you very much. And let's hope that you can unite all of these scattered voices. And there's so much needless suffering if we can just find a common ground. That's it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's conversation. And you can find Ahmed on mainly on X. That's his Twitter account. We'll keep sharing the links throughout this conversation, obviously. Okay. All right. That's it for... I've already said it. <laughs> okay. I'll see you next time, guys. Until next time. Bye-bye. If you'd like to support my work, you can become my patron by going to patreon.com forward slash or you can simply buy me a coffee.